Okay, well, I think we're going to make a start. Um, thank you so much for joining us at um, this morning's uh, to mark the launch from the Joseph Branch Fund Economic Insecure Health. Um, my name is Graham Cook. I'm Director of Insight and Policy at the Joseph Branch Foundation, and I'm really grateful to you all for joining the conversation. Um, as, as many of you hopefully know, our mission at JRF is about ending poverty, um, but we recognise that the experience of poverty for people is not fully captured by only looking at people's income at a point in time. And so we also think the lens of economic security is really, really important. So we think about issues around stability and control, certainty, having something to fall back on as it relates to people's income, but also their housing situation, their employment situation, their assets they hold or don't hold, um, and their family and wider community life. And this research is about exploring how those markers of insecurity relate to mental health and well-being in particular, um, and to see how those economic and psychological factors interact, reinforce one another, um, and potentially more positively can help to protect, provide protective um, factors as well. Um, so the research um, has some stark findings for the ways in which um, economic insecurity overlaps and interrelates across those different economic and psychological dimensions. And, and I think it challenges us to think differently about the nature of disadvantage, how it's experienced by people, and also the kinds of solutions that we should be focused on to try and um, both um, improve people's economic security, but also how that relates to their mental health and well-being. Um, so that's the sort of topic for the conversation. I hope people have a chance to, to read the full report. It's a fa fantastic paper um, with lots of new analysis in it. Um, and the plan for this morning is to hear from Tom Clark, uh, the, the main report author. Tom is a fellow at the Joseph Rancher Foundation, as well as being a journalist, a former editor of Prospect magazine, and uh, many other things too. Tom is going to take the first first half of the time this morning to to talk us through the main findings and implications of the of the research um, I'm then delighted to to welcome two brilliant responders um, to the work so Helen Undy the chief executive of money and mental health um, as well as Jane Green professor of politics at Nuffield College Oxford who's a, a pioneer of research on economic insecurity so after Tom has uh, spoken, Helen and I'll ask Jane and Helen to give uh, short responses. And then we're gonna leave some time at the end for the questions. Uh, the chat function is open, so please do add your questions as we go along. Um, uh, the other report author, my colleague, Andrew Wenham, is, is also gonna be on that uh, live chat. So we'll be able to respond to questions directly if people have them about the, the research. We'll, we'll also collect up some questions, including ones that a number of people have been keen to ask and put those to Tom and the other panelists um, for the last kind of 15, 20 minutes or so of the conversation. Um, so with no further ado, I will hand over to Tom. Thank you very much, um, Graham, indeed. Um, now, um, I'm hoping, can people see a slide? Yes, the slides have appeared, excellent. Right, um, so um, what we're gonna try and do today is get through um, three questions, I think, really. Um, the first one is, is Britain an insecure economy? The second one is, is this an anxious society? And to the extent that there's a yes in answer to either of those first two questions, could those two things by any chance be connected? So that's the sort of uh, way I'm gonna structure this. Um, next slide, please. I should just say by way of background to this report, which as Graham says, is jointly authored with Andrew Wenham. I mustn't take all the um, glory. Um, the, um, at the start of the year, there was a new sort of leadership team in the JRF in the form of um, Graham and Paul and Frank and Sophia, all the, the directors. So one thing we were asking ourselves is um, like, let's cast our eyes up a little bit from some of the granular research that JRF normally does and think about what looks like a really big problem or what looks like a growing problem across society as a whole. And we just looked at statistics on pretty much everything with an open mind. Now, um, one set of those statistics that I came across that kind of hit me pretty hard because it surprised me and looked like it could be a big problem regarded um, 
the uh, number of um, prescriptions that are around these days for antidepressants. Now, of course, we've got to be a bit careful because it could be um, that there's a greater willingness to come forward and seek help with mental health problems. That seems like a, a good thing if it's true. It could be that doctors, for whatever reason, are keener on prescribing those kind of medicines than they were in the past. But nonetheless, it's still true to say that people wouldn't come forward and seek these medicines unless there was some sort of problem, some sort of distress. And uh, with that in mind, if we just look at the sheer numbers on, uh, of these um, antidepressant medicines being given out, it looks like a big problem, I would say, to me. Um, 7.3 million English adults, which is 17% of the total, had antidepressants at some point during 2017-18. And if you factor in other medicines that are used for anxiety type symptoms, so sleeping pills, for example, that number rises to 11.5 million, or over a quarter of the total. We can't update that particular count, but if we stop counting people and instead count pills instead, then we can say that there's been continued growth up by a third over the last um, six years. So presumably that's going to be reflected in that 7.3 million going up in due course when the numbers come out. Um, so this observation just got us speculating um, uh, about the way that this could potentially, if this is a big um, uh, problem of well-being that we're seeing in, in, in these data, how would that connect to the stuff that JRF normally does around the economy, around low incomes, around um, insecurity in particular that we're, we're, we're more keen to focus on now? And um, we started thinking about the connections and um, this is pure speculation at this point, but they, they certainly seemed quite plausible. Uh, you can imagine a sort of cycle. Now, it's in the nature of a cycle that we could start anywhere, but let's start for the sake of argument with this problem of mental distress that we were just talking about. It's not hard to imagine that someone who's suffering with say anxiety is gonna lack confidence at work and that might slow their progress at work and perhaps leave them left on more unreliable shifts or with more unreliable earnings. It's not hard either to believe, uh, imagine that um, uh, mental distress is gonna turn into defensive moods that could strain relationships with family and others beyond, including people that you might rely on in, term, in, in times of a crisis when you need material help. It's easy to imagine too that unreliable earnings and strained relationships might, through pretty obvious channels like breakups or not having anyone there to help you in a crisis, turn into either instability in housing or problems with debt. And finally, it's not hard to imagine that problems with debt or insecure housing are in due course going to turn into problems of lost sleep at night and worse, mental distress. So um, at least um, as we sit here speculating, it's easy to imagine this kind of a vortex. Um, but enough speculation. Um, sorry, and I should say that's obviously a potentially sort of two-way street. We're not saying one thing runs complete to the other or the other way around. This looks like it could be a two-way uh, relationship where the mental problems aggravate the material problems and vice versa. But enough speculation. Um, let's um, turn to um, the question of whether financial insecurity really is a big problem in Britain compared to other societies. And uh, also separately, even if it is a big problem, is it a growing problem? Now, it's obviously a very, it's a slightly complicated concept. It's not something like, you know, GDP where we can just say, well, look, here's the insecurity index and, and that's that. You need to make a bit of a judgment. Um, but um, one good way to gauge how insecure Britain is compared to other countries uh, is provided by OECD numbers. Now, they provide numbers on two separate things. First of all, people who are poor, below their very low poverty line of 50% of median income. Those people are kind of palpably economically exposed. You know, if you, your washing machine or your car breaks and your income is very, very low, you're in trouble. You can't deal with that because you've not got um, the income to do so. But they're also interested, the OECD, um, in a measure of people who are not in, in, right now poor, but they are poor or exposed in the sense that they have um, insufficient income to keep them, insufficient savings to keep them going 
if uh, they lost their job uh, for three months or their income dried up for any other reason. And so what we thought would be a decent starting point for measuring insecurity was to take those two things together, either you're insecure because you're poor or you're insecure because you haven't got a buffer. And if you do that, you can see that the UK is, um, you know, uh, a bit more insecure than the most obvious um, big European comparator countries, so Italy, France and Germany. You can see it's quite a bit less insecure than, say, the United States, but it's an awful lot more insecure than secure societies like Japan and uh, Norway. So, you know, it's not the worst in the table, but it's pretty high up in the table. And then if we look at something else not on the chart, but something else the OECD has very good numbers on, which is what kind of protection is for you uh, if, um, in terms of social security system if you fall on hard times, um, then I think the UK's position worsens uh, further. Um, now, benefit systems are very complicated, but if we just focus on the unemployment benefit that you would get in the event of redundancy, then the UK, um, in terms of that single short-term measure of um, social security, has got about the meanest system in the developed um, world, which means that really, um, you know, unemployment would be a trapdoor to poverty for an awful lot of people in a way that wouldn't be the case, you know, if you're getting half or two thirds of your income paid for a period after you lost your job. So putting all that together, I think we can say that uh, the UK probably is at least a pretty insecure economy. I should also just say, you know, the percentages of people we're talking about here on, on that chart is sort of over 40% of people. So it's a, it's a lot of people. Now, having established it's a fairly big problem, is it necessarily a worse problem? Well, no, not necessarily. Problems can be big, but getting better, of course. Um, and in some senses, things have got better in the last 10 or 12 years because we've had a lot of jobs growth. And so there's a lot less unemployment than there was. But, you know, with that said, um, uh, jobs aren't everything, and especially not if those jobs are, for example, as they are for a million people in the UK these days, uh, zero hour contracts or other insecure um, forms of hiring. So there's a slightly mixed picture on employment, even if it's benign overall with the jobs growth. Um, and of course, insecurity is not just about jobs at all. So let's just turn to housing, which I think has been probably the biggest driver of insecurity. Those of us who are old enough to remember the 20th century, remember that it seemed like there was an unstoppable tide of rising home ownership. Every year, slightly more people tended to own their house than the year before. That had been true since Queen Victoria's time. Um, but sometime in the late 90s, and now going into the 21st century, that swung into reverse. I hadn't quite taken in the scale of it until we did this report, which is um, over the 21st century, if we just look at the whole working age population, there's been a roughly 10 percentage point swing between uh, the um, people who are buying a house with a mortgage, which means they're building up a stake and they're getting more secure in that sense over time, and people who are renting from a private landlord who are not building up an asset over time. And moreover, given the way that the private rental sector works in Britain, don't have any security of tenure. They could be booted out at short notice and they could face big rent increases at short notice. So that looks like a really major driver of insecurity to me. Um, and then let's move on to another aspect of it, just direct measures of savings. Next slide, please. Um, uh, what we call the no buffer zone there is just in looking in the main obvious government surveys, family resources survey or the wealth and asset survey, the proportion of people with no savings whatsoever um, looks to have gone up in a decade or so after the financial crisis. In the wealth and asset survey, it's up four points. In the family resources survey, it went up about eight points. And again, as I said on that first chart about the number of people who are insecure, you can just see the percentages there are very large, you know, it's either 36% or 41%. So more than um, a third of households in the country caught in this no buffer um, zone. Um, okay, so um, let's just click on to the next one, please. And so having established, I think that, you know, insecurity is in many respects, a big problem and in many respects, a growing problem. Let's just do the same thing with um, mental distress or mental health problems or whatever 
we're um, calling them. Um, now, the very simplest way, perhaps, to get a gauge on mental distress is not to start with the pills that I talked about at the beginning, but to look at the um, what happens if you just ask people, how worried do you feel? Which Whitehall's been doing since 2011. Now, if you look across the whole of society, the average rate of anxiety in terms of how worried did you feel yesterday has not really uh, changed so much. It edged down a little bit as the economy grew in the first half of the 2010s. It um, went up, obviously, with COVID. It's kind of gone down a bit as COVID receded. But it looks like a picture of broad stability. Um, but with some of that linked to, particularly when unemployment is falling, anxiety tends to fall as well, which is, which is good and what you'd expect. But there's two slight caveats on that we've got when we dug into this data a bit deeper. Um, first of all, after about 2015, people, specifically people who are in work, so this isn't a question about the unemployment, their average anxiety has tended to go up. And secondly, if we look at people who have got what the ONS classes as high levels of anxiety, I think that's more than six out of 10 on their 10 point scale, then um, if anything that's gone up since 2015, in the last few years, despite increasing jobs growth. So that looks like something that could be going a bit wrong there, perhaps. Um, let's move on from population-wide measures of uh, what the, um, how people are feeling to what is lurking in GPs databases. Um, increasingly, um, uh, statisticians can pull the kind of uh, coded GP notes uh, across hundreds of thousands, sorry, hundreds of practices to get a database on hundreds of thousands of patients, so really big data. And what that shows is that since 2010, um, the um, incidence of anxiety, whether that's an individual anxiety um, symptoms or a specific diagnosis, has rocketed. It's up by about half across the whole population. Um, and indeed, it's tripled amongst the very youngest adults, which when you think that they're the people on the sharpest end of some of those high, uh, employment hiring practices, and certainly in terms of the housing crisis, encourages you to think that maybe there is a bit of a connection here. Um, and then let's move from diagnosis on to uh, back to the question of pills. I've already shown you the numbers, but what I haven't done yet is shown you the numbers in terms of how they compare with other countries. Because obviously, if there is a global trend either towards more patients coming forward for help or um, uh, doctors being more prescription happy, as it were, then um, that would um, uh, colour the interpretation of those numbers. But if we look at the situation again using OECD data, we can see that Britain has become something of an outlier. Uh, in seven years after 2010, its um, daily prescriptions of antidepressants went up by about two thirds, you can see on that chart. You can also see that the rise was far smaller about 40% or something in Spain, smaller again in the case of Germany, and really very modest indeed in the case of Italy, and there was an outright fall in Denmark. Um, obviously, that's only selected countries, but if we put all the countries we've got numbers together, we can see Britain uh, moves from, um, you know, like something more like mid-table right towards the top as only small countries, possibly Iceland, I think, and one other um, up above Britain now. So it is a distinctly British um, phenomenon. And um, so again, I think now I can um, draw all that together and say um, that like there does look like there's at least something of a problem with mental distress. It does look like there's something of a problem with economic exposure of two. And so now we come on to the question of whether these two things could indeed be linked in the way I was speculating. Um, we can start without doing any new analysis, just looking at where all that prescription data on the antidepressants shows that most of these pills are given out. Let's have a look at this map. Um, these are the top 10 um, communities where you've got the highest rates of antidepressant prescription. What do we notice about them? First of all, they're all in the north, and we know that the northern economies have had a worse time for a long time. Uh, secondly, if we start looking at some of the individual names, um, we perhaps won't be, uh, we perhaps are reaffirmed in our view that this looks like it is connected with economic exposure. 
Um, Barnsley, for example, struggled badly to adjust um, from the um, collapse of the mining a generation ago. Blackpool um, uh, on Whitehall's index of multiple deprivation is the single most um, uh, deprived place in the country. And then within the Tees Valley, we've got Middlesbrough, which is the place that um, uh, if we're not looking county wide, uh, region wide, but we're looking at individual neighbourhoods. That's the place in the UK that's got the most deprived neighbourhoods on that same index of deprivation. So um, these kind of uh, correlate really quite closely to the places that Whitehall um, suggests are deprived. But then we wanted to dig deeper because all of this is kind of community level analysis. We wanted to like look inside the spiral for individuals by asking them both about how they fared on economic security and about how they fared in terms of well-being. Now, the sort of um, uh, landscape of official UK surveys is a bit frustrating here because we've got excellent surveys on assets and debt, like the Wealth and Assets Survey. We've got excellent surveys on um, well-being in terms of the annual population survey, but um, we haven't got so much that asks people about the two sides of things at the same time. What we do have, however, is um, one very large and very high quality survey, Understanding Society, that asks tens of thousands of people a year about all that basic economic information and also how they're faring on 12 different markers of mental distress, from waking up in the night to admitting that they're trying less hard at work, to lacking calm, to feeling worthless. So a really good range of um, suites that drop out of um, some um, established kind of clinical trials for gauging mental, sorry, clinical schemas for gauging mental health. Um, I'll dwell on this one for a moment, just because you'll see that the other charts that we'll go through are very much variations on a theme. So you've got that range of 12 different mental health markers on the left-hand side, losing sleep, can't make decisions and so on. You can read them hopefully going down. Um, we've kept things really simple here. We've divided the population into all homeowners, whether they own outright or whether they uh, uh, are buying with the mortgage and renters, whether they're renting from the council or renting privately. So it's just homeowners versus renters. It's a crude binary to make the picture really clear. If you're interested in a more detailed picture on housing, there's a whole annex in it in the report. But if we just do this crude kind of binary thing of owners versus renters, you can see that there's Dif there's, there's differences in every one of these 12 mental health counts. The differences go in the same direction and the differences are, I would suggest, big. Um, uh, on most of those counts, renters have twice or more of the incidence of the problems as do homeowners. Uh, they're three times more likely there to lose sleep. They're three or four times more likely not to be able to make decisions. They're a bit more than twice as likely to be depressed. They're, um, more than twice as likely to say that they're achieving less than they would like or that they're taking less care at work. And so it goes on. It even goes on it's almost twice as likely to say that they're lacking energy, which is remarkable when you think that homeowners these days are a much older group than our renters. So, you know, that whatever this anxiety is that's associated with renting looks to be kind of overpowering the effect of um, the age selection that, that, that you would think on a question like how, how energetic are you feeling might push the other way. So that's that for um, uh, home ownership. Um, let's just um, uh, click forward and see what happens when we look at savings. So we chopped the population into um, three brackets for this. Um, I'd like to concentrate on um, the Quarter, the contrast between the quarter or so of the population with um, uh, less than a thousand pounds in savings, so very minimal savings, and the half or so of the population that's got five thousand pounds plus. Um, so if we look at people with low savings versus you know um, decent savings, but it's not an elite; it's comparing them to the essentially the more prosperous half of the country. Um, and we can see basically exactly the same pattern. So I can do this one very quickly losing sleep twice as often, um, under strain about twice as much, depressed a bit more than twice as much, worth feeling worthless uh, three or four times as much. And so it goes on. So um, it really looks like huge effects there again for not having any money in the bank, just like there was for um, uh, being a private renter. 
Let's click forward. Um, next slide, please. Um, slightly more specialist thing here, specifically about um, uh, the effect of not having enough um, uh, in terms of pension provision in the run up to retirement. Another big um, uh, mark of insecurity that we asked about um, is asked about at specific and relevant ages. But here, if anything, if we concentrate this time on the fifth or so of the population with less than enough versus the rest who've got just about enough or more than enough, we can see really, really big differences again. They're at least as big as we saw on saving and housing, losing sleep more than twice as much, um, under strain twice as much, depressed several times more, uh, achieving less more than twice as much, downhearted three times as much or so on. So really big differences again. Um, enough about assets, let's think about um, a market of debts and in particular, next slide please, being um, behind on bills. This one is a sort of fairly unlucky minority, I think it was 10 or 5% or something of the population who report being behind on the bills, but this one is really very dramatic in terms of the effect. Um, we can see that amongst people who are struggling to keep up with regular payments, the incidence of all these problems is far higher than it is for uh, people who are up to date with all of their bills. And um, the absolute numbers are getting, getting quite a bit higher now, often over 10 and 20%. Um, um, so that's enough on the sort of balance sheet side of things. We also need to think about work, um, not just what you own and what you own, but also what you, what, how you earn your money. So what we did here is we divided the whole of the workforce that we've got in understanding society into two groups, insecure workers, which we picked out here on the basis of um, if they were temporary, if they were seasonal, if they were paid in a way that suggested an insecure connection, you know, if you're paid by the hour, for example, um, and um, we compared them uh, with other workers who are in secure work. Um, uh, and um, we get the same pattern. All 12 markers, um, insecure workers are suffering more from these mental health problems than are secure workers. Um, the gaps, however, are not quite as dramatic. Um, it looks like the kind of owing and owning dimensions could be even more important than the earning dimensions, I guess. Um, uh, lots of these markers are going up by about half rather than double or more. Um, so it looks like employment's having a big effect, but not as big an effect as, uh, for example, not having any savings or, or, or renting. Um, uh, I should say we also pulled out separately for data reasons we couldn't um, we couldn't do it across the whole population, but the zero hour contract group. Um, and again, very, very similar results to this. Um, uh, they fared worse on nearly all of these mental health indicators. But again, the um, excess risk that they were running was of the order of a half rather than um, double when we looked at housing and savings and so on. Um, now, um, uh, there still might be a nagging question in some of your minds as to whether what we're seeing here is really about insufficiency of income rather than insecurity of income. Uh, why do I say that? Well, you know, the people who are at the sharp end of the labour market, of the housing market and so on, are typically going to be uh, poorer people and life is certainly more stressful, you think, if you've got less money coming in. Um, this isn't sophisticated statistical analysis, it's just um, like looking at people who are either, you know, secure or insecure on the measures we've suggested. Um, if, for example, they were all very poor, it could be that that's explaining the whole results. So we thought it'd be useful to do a quick check on that. Now, apologies in advance, this next slide is the only one that's a bit fiddly, but let me make it simpler for you by telling you that the panel on the right hand side, which is about savings, is identical to the uh, savings chart you've already seen. So it's just there as an aid memoir. There's nothing new to take in on that. The panel on the left hand side is about income. And so that is new. That's just how much income you've got coming in. It's not directly measuring any sense of insecurity separately from that. And we've just divided the population into five income brackets from uh, poorest to richest in the way you'd, effect, uh, you, you'd expect. And we've applied that to our 12 mental health markers. 
what can we see? You've got the report. All of you who are watching have got a copy of the report, so you can look at this in detail. But to summarise, income is a bit like another security marker. On nearly all of the 12 markers, in nearly every case, if you've got a higher income bracket, you're at lower risk of these mental health problems than if you're in a lower income bracket. So there definitely is, you know, definitely is the case that income really matters. Um, but it is just worth pausing on the sharpness of that gradient compared to the savings one. Because if we, uh, if we compare the bottom earnings bracket to the middle earnings bracket, most of the differences here in terms of the risk rate for these mental health problems are of the order of a quarter or a half. Um, they're more like the work differences. Why do I want to focus on the, the, the bottom versus the middle? Well, you know, our official po poverty measure, that's what it does. Anti-poverty programs focus on that gap between the middle and uh, the bottom rather than the top end. Now, if you wanted to move um, from, you know, the, the, the the, the bottom fifth to the, to the middle of the income distribution, that would be a difference of about £8,000 in disposable income after tax each and every year. Now let's compare that with what's going on on the savings chart, where we've got um, uh, people at the bottom of the savings distribution compared to people in the middle of the top, whole of the top half with £5,000 plus. Um, the differences are much bigger, you know, they're, they're, they're double or, or, or triple. Um, and um, it's just worth, there's an awful lot of need for caution on this point, but it is just worth taking that in, that kind of £8,000 every year change on income uh, looks on these numbers, on superficially on the surface of it, to be having um, uh, le less of an effect than a £5,000 one-off improvement in the balance sheet. Now, that is not a causal claim. It doesn't translate easily into poverty, but it certainly makes you stop and think about how important security could be as compared to income as we normally think about it. Um, I'd just like to close with a few remarks on uh, the um, uh, policy um, uh, implications of this. So if we just click forward to the next um, slide. Um, I'd say there's three things, you know, we've seen that income matters, but insecurity really matters. It really is worth thinking about this insecurity lens. Um, uh, and so it's worth thinking about policies we can, can imagine that might deal with insecurity because they would not just redistribute security as it were, but they would also uh, affect uh, mental health. These results, at least on the surface, suggest as well as affecting um, uh, financial balances. What kind of policies take security seriously? Well, there's some very familiar ones that GRF's already banging the drum for very loudly. Like let's abolish the no fault evictions in um, housing so that private rental doesn't become as anxiety inducing as it currently is. Let's push forward with an employment bill that will give people new um, security over their hours that people at the bottom of the labor market don't currently enjoy. And maybe let's also think about things like debt advice and about even uh, uh, coming back to a discussion that's fallen out of fashion, but looks interesting in the light of these results about asset-based welfare and directly distributing some assets, because it looks like that might uh, do something for mental health as well as for um, the finances. Okay, I'm slightly over time, so I will just stop. Thank you so much, uh, Tom, uh, really comprehensive. And thank you to everyone who's been um, adding questions um, to the chat, um, which we've been keeping an eye on, and we will come to um, in a minute once we've heard from our two responders uh, to what we've heard. So I'm going to turn first to Jane Green, Professor of Politics at Nuffield College, Oxford, um, who's done a ton of work on this question of economic uh, security and its, its importance and its implications. Jane. Thank you very much, Graham, and thank you very much, Tom, and um, to Jera for inviting me. Um, so hi, everyone. I, I think, you know, the first thing I want to say is, you know, this is a very important contribution. Um, and it's not just, you know, so, so what are the key insights? The key insights is, are that this is not just about poverty, it's also about insecurity. And the other key insight is that insecurity is a source of mental health difficulty. Um, I would I would kind of just wanted to add a couple of things um, to the discussion and to to how we might think about these things. Um, 
one of one of the kind of key distinctions in this report is how to think about the population as a whole in Britain. And, you know, so the question is, I think for me, what is this, what are the downstream consequences if it's true that there's a rise in economic insecurity and that this is contributing to the rise in mental health problems, um, anxiety and so on, and this cycle is obviously then self-reinforcing if this is indeed the case. So why is that happening and for which groups is it happening? Um, so I just want to talk very, very briefly about those two things. And just before I do that, also say that I think this isn't just about it's not just about economic insecurity and about mental health, mental distress. It's also, of course, also about physical health and about productivity in the country and about economic growth, about all of those factors that are currently essentially slowing the British economy down, slowing our ability to invest in public services. So we can see these things as part of a much bigger picture because we know that mental health difficulties um, are highly correlated to problems of physical health and highly correlated to problems of productivity and economic growth. So, so this is a kind of, I would say this is even more important than Tom has said. Um, but so why is it happening and to, to whom is it happening? You know, and I think there, one of the things that might be useful is to think underneath the bonnet. So we might think about kind of, rather than think about the population as a whole, I mean, this, you have to, of course, the first place to start is to think about the population as a whole. But I think it's interesting to think about what are the changes, what are the relevant factors here that are changing over time that would lead us to kind of get greater insights into the types of groups that are very vulnerable to this increase in economic insecurity. And so here there's two steps. One is to say, what is economic insecurity? And Thomas focused on income and savings and housing and job security. And, and I would just really back him up and say that I also think it's all of those things. If we think about what economic insecurity is, sort of political scientists and political economists think about this in, in the sense of insurance. So if you have, though so traditionally, lots of people have studied the state as a provider of insurance, so the social security system. But if, well, there isn't just a social security system, and not only that, the social security system, is really an insurance of last resort. What's also important is this concept of self-insurance. So to what degree is the individual insured against risk, against loss, against kind of income volatility, and so on. And there we can think about savings and housing, job security, but also about um, you know, the, the, the demands on an individual in terms of affordability, in terms of the number of dependents in the household, um, and so on and so forth, the ability to borrow, whether someone has high levels of debt, these are all essentially encaptured in this concept of self-insurance. Um, so what are the big important changes and which groups is this happening to? And there I've done um, some, some work looking or really arguing for, for a kind of focus on particular groups that might have been impacted by the big trends we see in society and the big trends we see in the economy. So one of the big trends that we see is increasing generational wealth inequality. So we know that older individuals are more likely to hold housing wealth, um, as Tom um, referenced, and also more likely to have savings wealth. So if we think about kind of, but what is the, what is the change then? Well, the change is that it was much easier in the 1960s, 70s and 80s to buy a house and you are much more likely to see your house accumulate in value. It was also much more likely in the 60s and 70s that workers would benefit from social mobility. So there was an increase in social mobility in that time period. And it was also much more likely the case that if you didn't have a degree and you were non-graduate, that you could get a secure job um, and hold that job throughout your lifetime. And obviously that would be a, a source of security. So one of the things that's changed is home ownership. Um, asset, excuse me, asset ownership. And that has really created this age-based divide. And I think therefore age is one of the one of the reasons that economic insecurity is such an important lens, because you can have a low income but and be a pensioner, but still of course have a home and be more likely to have savings given those generational differences over time. Um, the other big 
shift, of course, is the impact of globalization and deindustrialization, you know, how the provision of secure work has changed. And I think, you know, then we also need to think about which groups in society have been most affected by those changes to the nature of secure work. And you see this in the US, um, you see Anne Cases and Angus Deacon, Deaton's work highlighting that it's non-graduates in America who are suffering from very extreme mental distress. Um, and it's likely to be younger, not young, but younger non-graduates in the UK too, who are suffering from this kind of mental distress. In the US, we have, of course, the factor of um, health insurance, um, but nevertheless, you know, we have also those same challenges in terms of the supply of secure work for those people that don't have degrees in our current economy. So that's one of the key changes. So we're looking then at age and we're looking at generations and then we're looking at graduates and non-graduates. We also see home ownership rates start to increase over time amongst graduates as the graduate pool in the UK increases in size as higher education has been expanded, but also because of those kind of wealth inequalities um, of people that go into education and do not. Um, so these are some of the very important changes um, over time, they open up the question of what then happens once you've got a population that's older, that tends to have assets, tends to have savings, who does that money go to? And where does, in, in terms of the economy as a whole, in terms of those generational differences and inequalities? And so the focus then is really on younger non-graduates who are more challenged because they're less able to cure um, accrue, sorry, housing, wealth and security in the form of assets and savings, but also who are more likely to suffer and struggle to have the kind of job security um, that was, was more true of older generations of non-graduates in the past. So I think, you know, I think it's an incredibly important topic. I think the way to kind of expand our understanding of this is now to look at kind of within the overall population to which groups as a function of all of those things we now understand are really important. And it's not just about income, it's also about those other factors, those other economic safety nets, forms of self-insurance, and then understand how those forms of self-insurance are impacting different groups over time. Of course, last, last comment is just that what's incredibly crucial is obviously the benefit system over the coming months and how that's changed. And that will also give us insight into which groups the government is supporting more, um, you know, more generously or not, whether or not that changes the nature of pension or poverty um, will be something really crucial to, to keep an eye on. But uh, I'll leave that because I'm desperate to hear what Helen has to say. Um, and thank you again and look forward to questions. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Jane. Yes, let me turn to you, Helen. Helen is the Chief Exec of Money and Mental Health and obviously the organisation working at the, the connection between the issues that we've been talking about today. Helen. Yes, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm really delighted to see this piece of work out in the world. It's made such a big contribution to this discussion. And so for those of you who don't know Money and Mental Health Policy Institute, we're a research organisation that specifically looks to understand and crucially tackle that link between financial difficulty and mental health problems, both through doing our own kind of research using similar national data sets and kind of other sources, but also we run a lived experience community of 5,000 people who all have personal experience of mental health problems. So what I wanted to add in my comments was hopefully a little bit of that to weave through that sometimes when we're looking at the national data sets, it's hard to get to the why. Um, and what we've done is spend an awful lot of time also talking to people to understand their reflections and their experiences of, of those relationships as well. Um, on the, the headlines, I mean, everything that um, Tom and Andrew have found really marries up with our own research over the last sort of six or seven years. I would say, so I share Tom's kind of slight nervousness about prescriptions data, but I think the picture that you're showing matches with quite a lot of other data sets. So I don't think we need to worry too much, but um, it is true that stigma in the UK has reduced around mental health and it looks as though it's reduced ahead of other European countries. So we would expect that we're seeing more people coming forward with conditions like anxiety and depression because it's particularly stigma around those mild to moderate conditions that's, that's reduced. Um, the Adult Psychiatric Morbidity Survey is the big kind of gold standard national study on prevalence of mental health problems. That's NHS data comes out every seven years and we're lucky that it also includes some economic um, measures as well. So you can do some comparison in there. 
we've done quite a lot of work with that data set and it marries up quite nicely with some of the things that you found. So that data does show an increase in mental health problems over the last few years, but mostly concentrated around anxiety. So we haven't seen a broad sweep increase in mental health problems, but anxiety and particularly anxiety for younger people and younger women has increased. And, and the financial data within that data set shows us that you are three times as likely to have mental health problems if you are in problem debt. And one of the things that's so rich about that data set is that it doesn't rely on disclosure. So it's a clinical screener embedded in a national survey. So it means that that's where the one in four figure comes from that you often hear talked about in terms of mental health problems. One in four of us on the call right now will have mental health problems. That's not one in four of us who know or one in four of us who've spoken to a doctor or had a diagnosis. That's one in four of us who would screen positive on a clinical screener for mental health conditions. And the highest prevalence there would be anxiety and depression. Um, and that data also shows us that half of people who are in problem debt have a mental health problem. So that relationship, particularly between financial difficulty and problem debt, is, is clear. It's evidence based. Um, I don't think you have to caveat your cycle as much as much as you did. Um, I think a lot of the arrows on that cycle are pretty well established and well proven now. Um, I really liked your diagram. We have a version of it that is uh, simpler. We did have a version of it that was more complicated and then it became so overwhelming that um, the post-it notes numbered in the kind of uh, 20s and we decided it was, it was unmanageable. But there were a couple of things um, on yours there that I would probably build on. One is we've talked about employment, we've talked about income. Um, the other thing that we know from the evidence happens when you're living with mental health problems, as well as income going down, is expenditure goes up and our ability to manage our money is reduced. So it's a triple whammy that's happening. And I think it's important not to just focus on one bit of that puzzle. So expenditure goes up in part because costs go up. So um, at the moment, a lot in the news, you're more likely to be on a prepayment meter on your energy. You're less likely to be leaving the house regularly. You've got your heating on more. You're more likely to rely on convenience foods, public transport. Your impulse control is reduced. You're more likely to gamble and you're more likely to shop on things that you regret. And that is a clinically proven relationship. And it's also much harder to manage your money and manage that relationship. So we know that understanding financial information, opening the post, calling your bank, understanding your energy bill, all of those things are much harder when you're struggling with your mental health. So that bit of your cycle, I think, tightens and becomes even more acute when you start to see all three of those factors playing in when somebody's struggling with their mental health. And the other bit where I'd add some extra arrows is when you are in financial difficulty, the, um, the actions of your creditors have a huge compounding impact on the mental health difficulties that we experience as a result. So we know from our research, um, you're three and a half times as likely to consider suicide if you're in problem debt. And we know that debt collection activity is a very significant trigger. That's again from that same national data set. So understanding how debt collection activity plays in here is really important. Um, and the reason I think I'm a bit of a, a stickler for that is when we get into the policy solutions, because I think if we look at the big picture economic relationship, what it does is makes a really strong case that policy interventions that reduce financial insecurity, reduce precarity, reduce problem debt, improve mental health. That's true. And I'm really pleased that I think today's report adds even more strength to those arguments. And that's really important, particularly in the current context around how we can demonstrate that it actually supports growth if we support people with mental health problems um, and particularly people back into work. Um, but if we can get a bit more granular, we also start to find more targeted policy solutions as well. So, for example, um, we need to make sure that employment advice and employment support for people is well targeted for those who have mental health problems, given the high rates of economic inactivity at the moment, and particularly economic inactivity driven by health conditions where mental health is the, the key kind of rising one in there. And we know from the evidence that broad, untargeted employment support isn't very effective for people who are living with mental health problems. So we need to get stuck in a little bit more into the policy on that. The same with um, 
we've done a lot of work on debt collection activity. We need better regulation of the bailiffs and better regulation of debt collection activity because going through a cost of living crisis and going into a likely recession, we know that we're going to be seeing higher rates of financial difficulty. That's unfortunately the situation that we're in. So while we do want economic measures that are going to try and bring down those rates of financial difficulty, we also need to look at mitigating policies that are going to help manage the mental health impacts of that rising financial difficulty. So key ones for us are around employment, debt collection. And the third one is about better integrating money and debt advice support into mental health services. So we are currently running a pilot of integrating money and debt advice in IAPT, which is the main talking therapies program. Um, we believe that offering money and debt advice to everybody who is going through mental health services, well, we've done some quite significant modelling on recovery rates and the impacts are quite dramatic that you can see, particularly on anxiety, actually, um, where if you give somebody support with their money, I mean, it's logical, isn't it? You, you finish a course of talking therapies and you, you come home or you put the phone down and there's a debt collection letter on your doormat that you, you don't actually need a national data set to talk you through what the impact of that is going to be. So, yeah, those are my main reflections. This is a really helpful addition and it really strengthens that argument about um, financial precarity and uncertainty as well as as well as income being a key factor. And I think if we add in some of those human experiences and a more detailed look at some of those drivers, we can add more on the policy side as well. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Helen. I think that really deepens and enriches um, some of the things that have come out of this report. Um, so I've been monitoring along with my colleague Andrew the questions. And what I'm going to try and do is go is, is offer a, a sort of a question that tries to draw in a few different points that people have raised to each of our panelists in our remaining time. Um, and and to, if I could ask our panelists to sort of have in their mind the, the current context, both the kind of cost of living moment, but also the fact, you know, in a, in a couple of weeks, the Chancellor is going to, uh, along with the Prime Minister, um, make a very significant um, set of announcements about personal um, tax and benefits, as well as the context of public spending for the, um, the coming years. So I think that's a very important kind of backdrop in our minds. Uh, and so please do, panellists, kind of offer thoughts on... Um, what you want to see uh, in that. But maybe if I come to you first, Tom, a few questions about the issue that you raised when you opened up, which is this kind of complex um, two-way relationship between economic factors and health factors and, and, and people sort of raising points about, you know, what's causing what here, uh, but also what should we, you know, in, when we think about what how to solve some of these problems, should we start at the health end um, and improve, try to improve people's health and that will unlock economic opportunities or, um, try to improve people's economic circumstances and generate a health dividend. Now, clearly, it's not kind of one or the other, but I wonder if you had any further reflections from the research or from, you know, what you think the government should do that might illuminate that. Sure thing. And, um, you know, really big thanks to both Jane and Helen for that. You know, no, I thought their, their, their contributions really complemented each other because Jane's sort of making sense of big picture politics through like this lens of insecurity and like, you know, that can explain things like voting behaviour and Helen's really kind of drilling down to like what it means for families at the, at the sharp end and things that we haven't thought of when we're doing a survey based approach, you know, about like the fact that yes, costs rise as well. Um, as I said, I think the causality is almost certainly two ways, um, uh, but um, I mean, it's pretty hard to think that it's all going to be flowing from mental health to aggravated kind of economic conditions. So it's sort of, it feels like we've seen these big things like increased use of private rental, diminishing number of people with any savings and so on, that seem to be real measurable things in, in, in the outside world. So it's kind of a bit easier to imagine those being the in the jargon, you know, the exogenous change that's kind of uh, sparking the whole thing off. But like, let's be clear, like any kind of anti-poverty charity, any kind of charity at all should be concerned whether the, if the causality is the other way around and we are taking people with mental health problems and allocating them to the most exposed bits of the economy. That doesn't sound like a very good idea either. So I'm sure there's some two-way causality. My kind of reading of it sort of judgment rather than any hard science here is that it's more going because there's more plausible channels I think from the material to the mental than the other way around um, but we need proper statisticians to, to, to look more into this before we can lock that down but we should certainly 
be um, very concerned either way. In terms of policy, um, uh, something else I'm doing at the moment, we're looking in um, with the Scottish journalist, Danny Garavelli, we're looking at the place in Glasgow where people have got the lo lowest life expectancy in the whole of the UK and uh, all the kind of um, cycles of chaos and, um, and, and hardship that kind of contribute to that. And what I found really interesting is that the GPs there are spending you know, their scarce money on bringing in what they call links workers, which are like basically people who um, would otherwise come and present at the GP with like, oh, I don't know what to do, I can't turn my gas meter on. All the, all the practical social and economic problems that um, might turn into very specific physical problems like hypothermia, but also just will certainly turn into anxiety and GPs can't deal with them all. So even though they're resource strapped, they find it's in their interest to spend a proportion of their strapped money on these essentially kind of social workers fixers to, to who can who can deal with all the all the stuff that um that gets in the way of um you know broadly defined um good health in terms of the budget what we need to do um obviously we need um some security all the people it doesn't do anyone any favor who's looking at these rising prices in the shops and they're still not being told by Rishi Sunak now whether their benefits are going to go up in line with those prices despite him having promised it a few months ago and not much having changed since apart from um, a kind of rather uh, spectacular government owned goal in the autumn so uh, that would be a sort of macro measure of security we could introduce but on the micro level I think those kind of society meets mental health kind of places like links workers in GP surgeries are probably the priority. I'm frankly terrified that those are exactly the kind of things that are likely to be um, easy cuts in the event of the new age of austerity. Thank you very much, Tom. Right, we are almost out of time, but I'm going to come to Helen, if that's OK, for one last um, reflection, which is on this issue of kind of assets and pensions and you know, as Tom said, um, there was asset based welfare was in vogue uh, uh, some time ago. Obviously, there is, you know, there is policy development around kind of debt and money advice, as you well know. But the extent to which we should think much more seriously and systematically about the role of assets and wealth um, at, for, for those in low to middle income households as being a really important part of um, an anti poverty strategy, that would be really interesting to hear you. Yeah, I think we should. It is really important. And actually, um, you've queued me up nicely to give a quick plug to some research we're doing on mental health and pensions at the moment, which you didn't know about. So I know that wasn't purposeful. But um, so we're doing an in-depth look at the moment at kind of what that mental health pensions gap is and what impact lifelong mental health problems have on your ability to build up assets and, and particular savings pot for retirement, both looking at you know, periods of sickness absence through work and your kind of reduced ability to actually save. But also there are some complicating factors in there when you're living with mental health problems. One of the things that comes up quite often in our research is a short termism that comes from living with mental health problems. I mean, at the most brutal end, if you if you're feeling suicidal and you don't think you're going to live very long, why would you be saving for your pension pot? Um, but also if you just are struggling day to day to get up and get showered and dressed, then saving for your pension feels a million miles away. But there's also the bit that I mentioned around financial capability and decision making is particularly difficult around pensions. So people are having to make a very big and important set of decisions in the run up to retirement that will affect their financial future for the long term. It's hard for most of us to understand those decisions. Now try and understand them when you're also in the kind of fog of anxiety and depression. And we are seeing particularly people who are taking early retirement as a result of their mental health, then having to make a very large set of financial decisions in a period of time when they are not very well, with very little support. So we're doing a piece of work that also looks at effectiveness of pensions guidance and how that can be better targeted and what kind of support can be offered to people through that journey as well. Because, yeah, I think it is crucial. We do our work at Money and Mental Health has until now focused more on kind of working age adults and on the most acute end of kind of financial difficulty in the present moment. But when we started speaking to our research community, we did a speculative survey on pensions last year just to see whether it was something that they wanted to work with. And as I say, this is 5,000 people with experience of mental health problems. It's the most popular survey we've ever done. And whenever we ask them about pensions, we get the highest number of respondents, even compared to benefits, which really shocked me. And I think it's because people haven't been asking about it and it's a real source of anxiety for people as well. So I'm pleased that will be coming out um, in the first quarter of next year. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much. Good tip off. Um, we are out of time. Um, it's been a very, very full discussion and apologies to Jay for not being able to uh, come to a question for you and apologies that we haven't been able to get to all the questions that people have left. I hope um, people have enjoyed and found the conversation stimulating. Um, obviously at JRF, we're going to try and build on this work um, and push it in different directions. Um, thank you to Tom and to Andrew Wenham, who was the other report author, to Jane and tell it to my colleagues, Eleanor and Mark, for organising today's webinar. And um, I hope we will see you at another JRF event soon. Thank you very much, guys. Enjoy your day.